If your organization is pursuing artificial intelligence as a way to improve productivity, you now can assign a personal AI assistant to every employee who will coach that employee throughout the day in micro course corrections to result in higher productivity. So our companies have hired more than 2000 people and we began to test this AI coaching technology in early 2023 with some remarkable results, which I'd like to share with you as well as how you can uh, use this technology in your own organization. All right, so let's get started. So first off, let me just point out that if you've already been pursuing AI, you've been probably mostly thinking about automation and not so much about uh, human performance. Okay, so this technology obviously deals with the human performance side of things, but on the on the type of tasks that only humans can perform. So if you can improve the human performance uh, in the future, this will actually be more valuable than it even is today. The, the more automation that you implement in your organization, the value of human time actually goes up, not down. I'll show you how that works and, and in a dramatic way. But um, uh, let me just share uh, um, one or two quick examples from our, our own experiences. Um, uh, th so the as I mentioned, the AI assistant can be assigned to an employee. Now what happens is the AI assistant is aware all day long of what the employee is doing. It works side by side with the employee and it can intervene, have a conversation with the employee at any time. And uh, one of our employees in one of our early experiments with the technology, um, the AI system detected that um, this particular employee was zoning out frequently throughout the day. So he'd be working away and then all of a sudden he would just like go into, um, you know, almost like go into a daydream type state. And the, uh, the AI system then began to coach him and nudge him out of these states frequently. And what, was hap what happened was quite remarkable. His, his overall productivity went up by 47.1%. And uh, we thought that might have been an exception, but then the AI system detected a girl who was uh, getting on Facebook Messenger about every five minutes, interrupting her tasks, whatever she was working on, to you know go over and I guess chat with friends and family, um, and uh, the defocusing of her off of the the task at hand was enough to seriously impede her overall productivity. So the AI system autonomously detected that, autonomously began to coach her, and her productivity went up by seventy nine percent. So we were blown away by these results, really greatly encouraged to continue. And so today, of course, uh, we've come a long ways from there. And I'm going to share with you some of the, uh, I guess, the mechanisms that we're using today and how you can use these, this technology in, uh, in your company. First, let me just say something about Haler, uh, if you're not familiar with this term, um, uh, H-A-I-L-R. It stands for Human to AI Leverage Ratio. Now, um, we recently um, released an academic paper on this topic. Um, my son and I, my son is a data scientist, and him and I have been working together for years. Um, the, the, he plays a, a central role in, um, uh, well, we have a digital marketing company, and then we also have a visual effects company that serves the, uh, the movie industry, VFX Los Angeles. Um, anyway, uh, him and I and three PhDs released this academic paper on this topic. And really, just it's all about this idea that in the future, one minute of human time input into an automation system, let's use ChatGPT as the example, since everybody's familiar with that, one minute of human time would result in some multiple of human equivalent output. So, for example, um, you spend one minute typing a prompt into chat GPT, like say, uh, write me an article on the topic of Lenin's influence on the modern family in Russia. Okay, and you click go, and maybe it takes you a minute to do that. Uh, chat GPT goes away with the all the LLM magic in the background, and it writes you this great article that would have taken a human perhaps several hours to research, if you weren't already an expert in the topic, several hours to research and then to write it as well. So you might have gained, say, for every one minute of human input, you might gain 100 minutes of human equivalent 
productive output. Or to put it another way, 100 minutes of value. Okay, and that's what we're all after. It doesn't matter what kind of organization you're in. Um, you're all after generating some form of value out the other end. And it's imperative that we be efficient. Anyway, this idea of Haler is that one minute in, in this equation, one minute of human time, it outputs 100 minutes of uh, productive value. And you can see then with this type of a formula, how the more you integrate automation into your organization, the more valuable these human minutes become. So the idea of uh, using AI to um, optimize human performance is, uh, is, is totally congruent with this idea of, of, uh, of automation. And by the way, automation is, is a wonderful thing, but think about it, there's not many automation tools available to us today uh, not out of the box, at least. And if, you, if you're if you a larger organization, you've got the capital to invest in custom automation solutions, you'll know that that's expensive and that it's time consuming, that at the very least it's going to take years, right? Uh, McKinsey says um, that we can, the technology exists that we could theoretically uh, automate over 60% of all work today. Now that number is growing fast. So, uh, but as, as fast as, as rather as capable as the technology is, the use cases haven't been developed. And so there's not a lot of opportunity to automate big swaths of our workflows just yet. So it's mostly just humans doing the work still, but that's changing too. Um, in fact, uh, let me just draw a graph here. And, and so this is all of work over here on this Y axis, 100% right now is done mostly by humans, right? In fact, by humans alone. Okay, and then let me use a different color. Down here, we've got what we would refer to as this new form of um, productivity or source of productivity, which is autonomous. But uh, in fact, it's not truly autonomous, is it? Because humans are still involved in the loop. Um, they're writing prompts, they're pushing buttons, they're they're planning, they're initiating, they're reviewing, they're ultimately valid, validating the final output. And so I would refer to this as human assisted autonomous work. And this is a growing segment, right? So this is going to grow over time. Right now it's at, you know, next to zero, but that's going to grow over time. And the work that humans do alone will shrink over time, right? That's what it's going to look like. This is the trajectory we're on, not a trajectory that that um, science fiction writers are writing about, this is, uh, this is already happening. Now, uh, in terms of the uh, productive output, uh, every one minute that a human works right now today generally outputs one minute of productive output. One minute, sorry, one minute of, of work equals one minute of productive output, right? That's generally where we are now because humans are doing the work alone. A human works for a minute, it, it can't generate two minutes worth of work. He's generating, he or she is generating only one minute of work. All right. So that's where we're at today. However, go ahead into the future and eventually we'll be at, on average, one out of two. Now, we don't have a lot of automation tools available to us today, although that is growing. And so it might take us a while to, on average, um, and some industries will be faster than others, um, we'll be somewhere around for every one minute of human time, we'll be outputting two minutes of equivalent productive output or two minutes of value. Now, a little while after that, that'll change to one out of one out of five, oops, one out of five, and then it's going to go to one, one to 10. Not one out of five, sorry, one to five. So one minute of human time equals five minutes of productive output. Uh, one minute of human time equals uh, 10 minutes of productive, productive output. Now, that's where we're going. This is happening. Uh, it's going to happen no matter what, unless there's a, you know, some kind of weird, you know, asteroid hits the earth type of catastrophe. Uh, this is happening, right? And so the, uh, the, the, the case I'm making here, or rather the case that Haler makes, is that if you lose a minute here, right here, you only lose a minute of value. But if you lose a minute here, you, you lose two minutes of value. And here you lose five minutes of value. Now let me point out something else. Um, that the that the time to get from one to one to one to two is um, whatever time that takes. It's probably going to take less time to go from one to two to one to five, okay? Because the uh, artificial intelligence is getting it's developing, right? The models are getting smarter, uh, the computational capabilities of our hardware are getting faster, 
and um, and so on. So here's the 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 punchline here for us who are operating organizations is that if a competitor gets started with automation before you, in fact, let's roll both of these into one um, with uh, either uh, automation and or uh, human performance optimization, if they can get ahead of you by a year, let's just say theoretically, the productivity output goes from one from one to two in your first year, probably not likely, but let's just say for the sake of the story. Okay. So in the first year, you go from one to two. In the second year, you don't go from two to three, you go from two to four. That's the principle, right? So the idea here is that if your competitor gets out ahead of you by a year, when they're going from two to four, you're still going from one to two. And when they're going from four to eight, you're still going from two to four. And the chance of you ever catching them is very low. And there's only really only one way to catch them at that point, And that's to way overspend, spend way more money than they spent. And uh, that's the only way to possibly feasibly catch them. And even then, it might not be possible. Okay? There may be other factors that uh, prevent you from and but the cor corollary of this is also true. If you can get ahead of your competitors by a year or even six months, it may be enough to enable you to get enough of a lead time that this idea of nonlinear uh, acceleration kicks in and you're able to stay ahead of them. And I think, I believe that there's a case could be made that, um, that, uh, that uh, if, you, if you can get enough lead time, you actually might be able to destroy your competition. They might not ever be able to catch up and there might be no way for them to compete. Um, and that's of course just a theory at the moment, but I, I think there's a case could be made for it. So the growth of human assisted autonomous work is underway. The decline of work that humans perform alone is already underway and it's really only a matter of time. This is an inevitable future that we just cannot avoid. It's, it's lo long past theory, right? Now, how do you take this and translate it into human performance? So let me, let's talk about that for a minute because this is really interesting. If you wanna improve, um, human performance and how this AI systems work is first thing you got to realize is that, um, well, let's do another chart here. Uh, let's call this over here, the rate of productivity. Okay. So this is a 0% rate of productivity and this is a hundred percent rate of productivity over here. And you'll know from experience if you've managed people before that the rate of productivity for employees generally goes up and down throughout the day. Okay. It's not static. It, uh, it changes. And there's a reason that it changes. Okay. And we'll get into that in a second. But first up, what I want to point out is how we measure productivity here and that we measure productivity is super important because um, you, you'll remember one of the quotes that made Lord Kelvin famous that what we do not measure, we cannot optimize. What we don't measure, we cannot optimize. And the opposite of that is true. The, what we do measure, we have the opportunity to optimize. Not a guarantee, but at least we have the potential to optimize it. But without measurement, you cannot do it. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're measuring how many sales a sales rep makes per day. And let's just say the sales reps making 10 sales a day. This is a great way to measure productivity because it focuses on value. However, it's got weaknesses. One of those weaknesses is that it is opaque and that you can't see what might have been. Okay. So for example, we know of a fellow who was a highly paid sales rep for a um, well capitalized company uh, during COVID a sales rep worked at home and uh, was making enough sales that the executive team was happy with him. Um, what the executive team did not know is that this employee spent four to five hours out of every single day playing video games. So while the company was happy with their, uh, with the sales reps rate of productivity, in this case, uh, the number of sales they made, what they didn't know was how much was left on the table. And, uh, you know, having um, hired many, many sales people in the past, uh, I can tell you that generally speaking, the more time you spend talking with prospects, 
the more sales you make. The fewer time, fewer, the less time you spend speaking to prospects, the fewer sales you're going to make in general. Okay, all things being equal. And so, as an example of not being able to see what's possible, if you only measure the number of sales that was made, you can't really see the opportunities. So, add some data, and all of a sudden you'll start to see opportunities. So, for example, you might say, well, how many hours per day? What if your system could measure how many hours per day? a typical sales rep was spending on the phone with prospects. And what if you discovered that the sales rep was spending only two hours per day actually on the phone and the rest of the day he was doing whatever, you know, writing proposals and whatnot. But what if it was only two hours per day? Okay. How would you optimize that? You know, even somebody with no sales experience or sales management experience might start thinking, well, kind of common sense tells me the more time he spends on the phone, the more sales he's going to make. So how can we move him from two hours per day to two and a half hours a day or two and a half hours a day to three hours a day, right? And so the data gives you a clue as to how you might optimize that. So what you measure might be optimized. And so it's important to measure. And, and uh, now from experience, I can tell you that the more you measure, the more opportunities you spot. Okay. So now let's... Um, Look at a system where in a given day, your productivity, let's use a 15 minute blocks in a day, okay? There are eight hours in a day and 32 15 minute blocks in a day. And what if you could create a productivity measurement system for each employee that would measure their rate of productivity? What if you could see that productivity doing things like this throughout the day? What would you do? First thing you would do is you would say to yourself, well, what makes this different from this? And the moment you see what difference, what, what the source of the difference is, you would then begin to get optimization ideas. Okay, so now fast forward to modern uh, AI technology where there's personal assistants and AI coaches available who have the ability to collect data and monitor everything that's going on. That's exactly what this technology does. So we started collecting focus data and behavioral data. We, we, we wrote desktop software that would do this. And um, we started collecting thousands of data points per day and feeding them into a custom algorithm that we developed that's actually patent pending that is essentially is capable of creating a productivity score for any employee in any position in any role in your company as long as they're on a computer so so far uh, we're not collecting data off of um, watches so we're not collecting it from carpenters we are collecting it from people who are knowledge workers so they work they generally work on a computer most of the day or part of the day. All right. And so what if you saw the productivity score here was 25% and here it was 70, 75% and here it was, you know, 20 and 26 and 15 and so on. You're like, holy macro, what the heck is going on? If they can operate at 75% here and, you know, 60% here, how on earth are they at 20 and 26 and 15 over here? And the, mo the moment you ask that question, what you get to do with this system is you get to peer into the data and you can see the focus and behavioral data that's driving these productivity scores and instantly you start to get um, ideas. And even a human being can do this. You don't need to be an AI system, but then now add the AI coach that is aware of all this and can catch it in real time. The AI coach or AI uh, personal assistant can spot these, this data and now can start to coach the user on how to improve, right? And um, not everybody's a thief. Not everybody's just out to waste time all day long. Some people are just distractible. You know, lots of us have ADHD to some extent and we're just distractible by nature. It's not uh, evil, right? <laughs> and we're not intentionally doing it, but we can look away and look out the window and get stuck there for a while. So it just happens, right? But if the AI system can bring us back and use intrinsic motivation to bring us back so that we ourselves are motivated. We ourselves want to do better. That's the key, right? You don't want to just use the carrot and the stick all the time. You want people to think for themselves, act for themselves, have a sense of autonomy and be truly motivated long term, not just today in the moment when they're being course corrected. Okay, and that's the key. So that's, it's in the system by design, it's in the architecture. And so um, in order to do this, 
number one, you've got to have focus and behavioral data. And then two, you've got to convert that focus and behavioral data into some kind of performance score so that you can analyze it and you can review it so you humans can do it. And then so your AI coaches can do it. And now, uh, we have been using two streams of AI coaches. One is, as I mentioned, the personal AI assistant that gets assigned to everybody. Uh, and then we've got another stream of coaches that uh, represent management. So while the AI assistant works for the betterment of the employee for their their career and their life and their job on in the moment, that's still a good thing for the company because the person does better on their job. Obviously, it it, uh, it um, benefits the company. But eh, sometimes some people have to be hauled under the carpet, don't they? I mean, somebody that's perpetually late or they're developing a habit of being late needs a stern talking to. There needs to be a course correction at a bigger, deeper level. And so in that case, what the AI coach is capable of doing that represents the management, it's able to intervene in the middle of the day. The um, coach has a conversation with the uh, employee and says, hey, I'd like to have a chat with you. It looks like you've been developing a habit of being late. I'd really like to have a, a little bit of a discussion with you. Can we have a meeting tomorrow morning? Let me check our calendars to see uh, when we're available. Oh, I can see you have availability at 1030 in the morning. The AI coach can actually read the user's calendar. Um, can I book us in for a 15 minute chat tomorrow morning at that time? And, uh, and, or if not, then we can pick another time. Or employee says, oh yeah, that'll work fine. The AI coach is then able to go into the user's calendar and he books it. He then starts when the meeting's uh, coming close, he can send reminders to the user along with a link to the meeting. Uh, room, the person uh, gets clicks the link, shows up at the meeting uh, the next day, and there's a stern dressing down. Okay, you're serious about your career here, aren't you? You know that reliability is something we all value, right? You know that reliability tends to reflect on a person's trustworthiness. If you're not reliable, we don't know if you're going to be predictable, and therefore we don't know if we can, you know predictably rely on you to do anything when we say you're going to do it. And so there's a bleed over. Uh, you understand that, right? Okay, you get the point. This is how the coaches approach this with some, and then, you know, we would like to um, give you raises and promotions and bonuses and job security, but, you know, you need to demonstrate that you really want to be here. And when you show up perpetually late, you're not demonstrating that. So can I rely on you to change your behavior? This is exactly the kind of conversation that a human supervisor manager would have with any employee who's displaying that kind of behavior. And uh, you would expect change. And in fact, that is what has been happening. Change has been happening. And the AI coach, whether it represents manager or the AI personal assistant that's, excuse me, still trying to help the person in their day to day, uh, both of them been effective in, um, in helping people change their behavior and uh, make small course corrections enough so that the performance uh, changes dramatically enough that that um, we all notice. And that's what's been happening. Okay, so let me now show you one more thing that's really, I think, gonna blow your mind. Um, it did mine when I first saw it. It has to do with what is left on the table and what is actually truly possible. So let me say that um, in an eight hour day, Actually, let me move this over to the left just a little bit. In an eight-hour day, there are 480 minutes. Okay. Now, this isn't 480 minutes of productivity. This is 480 minutes of potential productivity. Now, nobody is 100% productive 100% of the time. Okay. Some people might be 70 or 80% of the productive percent productive. 70 or 80% of the time, but other people are 10 or 20% productive, uh, you know, uh, percentage of the day. And you get the idea. Uh, the, I, the general idea here is that nobody's 100% productive. And if you ask Google, uh, what you'll find is that the general consensus out there is the average person is truly productive two to three hours out of a day. Okay, that's what it says. So, if that's true, let's just use three hours as the, um, as the uh, given the benefit of the doubt, that is 180 minutes, and that leaves 300 minutes of what I will refer to here as rescuable time. Now, when I first saw this, I didn't believe it because I thought, you know, um, uh, I didn't believe it in general, certainly not for me because I'm 
I, you know, I think of myself as a pretty productive guy. Um, but then I started looking at some of the data that the AI system was dredging out of my, <laughs> out of my, um, the reservoir of my, the data lake belonging to me and my behavior. And what I discovered is that just over one out of every 10 hours, I spend looking at my uh, email inbox. And when I saw that, I really couldn't believe it because I, I would have, if somebody asked me, you know, how long, how much time do you spend on your inbox? I would have said, you know, maybe 15 minutes a day. And there's no way I would have said an hour a day. Because if you think about an hour a day, that's like, you know, if you're working five days a week, that's five hours a week on email uh, if you're working 10 hours a day, and um, which I tend to do. And, uh, and multiply that by, you know, by 50, five times 50, and you're all of a sudden you're in like 250 hours. Well, that's like, how many weeks is that? That's like four or five hour, uh, weeks a year just looking at friggin' inbox. There's no way that that can stand, right? And now if somebody like me, an executive <laughs> with lots of responsibility, lots of people under me, you know, just frittering away time like that without even knowing it, what do you think the rest of everybody else is doing? Well, so my point is, is that I, I kind of somehow got my head around, it actually might be possible that maybe we really truly are productive only three hours out of every day and all the other minutes we're busy and we're, or whatever, we're doing something, right? Um, but not, we're just not generating value. So, okay, now here's where it gets really, really interesting. What if you could rescue using this fancy AI technology, what if you could rescue just 10% of the rescuable time? So if you could, if you could rescue 10%, uh, you'd be rescuing 30 minutes. Now add that 30 to the 180. Now you're productive, truly productive, generating value 210 minutes out of a day instead of 180. And that's enough, I suggest, that for some industries might actually be a game changer. Okay? If you can reduce the cost of generating whatever it is you generate in terms of value, if you can reduce the cost on average by 10%, because remember, the costs don't go up. Right? You're just generated in 10% less time. So if you could, um, if this is just a pure time-based system, all things being equal, because remember, this is just for, for demonstration purposes, um, think about what the impact is and how many industries might actually be able to gain competitive advantage with just a 10% increase or decrease in cost. Uh, if Blue Origin were competing with SpaceX to deliver um, parts up to the International Space Station, the uh, NASA and the federal government might be inclined to give the contracts to the company that is 10% cheaper. When we're talking about millions and millions of dollars, 10% means something, right? So for some industries, just 10% might be enough to swing the tide and get competitive advantage. That's not every industry. Other industries might need more. So let's use that. Let's go up to 20% here. What if you could capture and save or rescue 20% of these 300 minutes. 20% is 60 minutes, okay? Now, 60 minutes plus 180 is now 240. 180 plus 60 is 240, and we're starting with 480, and 240 is half of 480. So what I'm proposing to you is, if you can believe this number that we're all starting from a baseline of 180, and I've come to kind of accept it. Um, if you can believe that and you can, you know, theoretically believe that you might be able to rescue 20% of the rescuable time, bringing the total minutes of productivity in a day up to 240, you're still only at a 50% productivity. All right? 480 original minutes, 80 plus 60 is 240. You're still only productive 240 minutes out of the day. I submit to you that that is possible. Okay, I don't think it's a reach. I think it's uh, totally possible. And I think more might be possible from what I've seen so far. All right. So now it gets interesting because um, Haler right now is one to one. Okay. So you're one minute of human time, you've rescued one minute of value. So the 60 minutes here is uh, you're, you're recovering 60 minutes of value, okay? 60 minutes of output. However, in the future, when we get to one to two, that 60 minutes becomes 120 minutes of value output, and one to five, 
that 60, that same 60 minutes becomes 300 minutes of productive output. And you can see now, all of a sudden, this is starting to look like a game changer because 300 minutes on the day is more than the total amount of minutes we're spending, we're, we're producing right now as it is. So the moment you start capturing and uh, rescuing these minutes, all of a sudden you're getting these, this uh, multiple effect. And uh, so once again, I was to remind you how important it is to get ahead of everybody with this because it's not going to stay at one to one long. And once you hit one to two, it's not going to stay there long. Okay, so you've got to get ahead of everybody in order to, I believe that the day is coming, there's going to be a lot of frontline uh, A-list players in the future that, that are right now, they're A-list, that will be reduced to rubble in the future because they're not paying attention, they're not moving fast enough, and they're, they're sitting with their head in the sand, not really paying attention to what is the inevitable future. It is immutable. The future is not going to change at this point, and again, unless there's a an asteroid event or something like that. Um, so get started now uh, and uh, get on the bandwagon. I really think that, that we all need to be doing this with a real, real sense of urgency. Um, okay, um, let me show you, I guess, one more thing. And that is, um, if you wanted to do this, what would you do? Like, how do you get started? I mentioned to you that you need focus and behavioral data to get insights into the productivity and so that you can come up with some judgment calls on to how to improve the performance and either you've got to do it as humans or you've got to you know relinquish that to the ai and let the ai system do it in phase one of this system i mentioned to you and promised that i would tell you how to get you could do this in your organization get started in phase one what you do is you put what we refer to as the obs observability engine that's how we refer to it it's really just a fancy way of saying we take desktop computer we put it on windows machines we put it on mac machines and it sits there in the background it's silent um, you tell your employees there so of course and tell it what's there for we're preparing for the future we're integrating ai into our system and part of that is well, ai is data hungry ai doesn't work without data so if you want to use ai you got to have data all right so no of course we'll do our best to protect privacy We'll obviously do that and we'll secure that data and so on. And we're not going to intentionally collect private information in the first place. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, but you know, the point is, is that here you're going to start collecting whatever data is observable while a person's working during their work hours. And once you've got that, you then have the ability to see that chart and start identifying what the difference is between high cycles of productivity and low cycles of productivity. And trust me, that's an eye opener when you see that for the first time. And then in phase two, once you've, once you've seen this, what you do is you now integrate the AI coaching system to both the, uh, the uh, personal AI assistant as well as the AI coach that represents management. You implement that and you customize it. Has, there's some training involved to um, deal with the issues that are unique to your organization because every organization is slightly different and certainly every industry is different. And so once you've got the, uh, the data flowing and the visibility into productivity and once you've got the AI coaching system in place that can autonomously help nudge our users throughout the day, helping them make these many course corrections throughout the day, what happens is you end up with higher human performance, which enables you to leverage the uh, human to AI leverage ratio as you integrate more and more automation tools. And so it's imperative you get going quickly, but if, even if you haven't started now, it's not too late. Um, a wise man once said, what's the best time to plant a tree? And uh, his answer would be 20 years ago. Uh, what's the second best time to plant a tree? And of course, the answer to that is today. So it's not too late. And I'll leave that with you. <laughs>